struggles and, and freedom struggles in particular have had such an important impact on the globe. Everywhere I go, Black Lives Matter is understood as a part of a long legacy of a movement of black people trying to fight for our freedom. It doesn't always mean that it's going to translate into a particular place, but that doesn't mean that there aren't very important conversations that Black Lives Matter has initiated that can happen everywhere. Um, we have to talk about blackness. Uh, we have to talk about how um, uh, many indigenous Hawaiians are actually black. What does it mean to claim blackness? What does it mean to have a black politic? Um, and this idea that, the, uh, that Black Lives Matter isn't a separate struggle for black people to um, take on. It's actually a struggle for every single one of us um, because really and truly when black people get free, everybody else gets free. Aloha and welcome to the special panel, Black Visuality and Solidarity in Oceania. This panel is presented as a important program, uh, part of the, the collaboration between the Sundance Film Festival and Honolulu Museum of Art. I'm Akemi Glenn of the Popola Project and I'll be one of the moderators for this conversation. This conversation is part of a series of five conversations that will be used to frame some important developments in the way that we make media and consume media in the 21st century. This conversation in particular is going to be looking at the ways that we think about race and social justice and change using media as a way to connect across distance and to learn and uh, strategize across communities. Um, this conversation is going to be co-moderated by my colleague, Dr. Ethan Caldwell of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and we'll be featuring uh, several media makers, performers, and scholars as they share with us their ideas about how media and the representation of Blackness in particular has potential for building solidarity in Oceania and around the world. Thank you, Dr. Glenn. My name is Dr. Ethan Caldwell. And I'd like to welcome everybody once again to our program. Um, want to also acknowledge that we are in an occupied, unoccupied lands uh, in the Hawaiian Kingdom. And want to you know, keep that in mind as we go along through today's program is to also be aware of the context that you are also tuning in from. Today's program is going to work uh, through a format that mixes the individual interviews along with the group discussion. And we're actually gonna start off with interviews from our panelists along with uh, showing some samples of their work. And then we'll also have a group discussion where we bring everybody together, um, including a chance for you as the audience to participate as well. Uh, but first, um, Dr. Glenn and I would like to speak with you a little bit deeper about what we mean by black visuality and solidarity in Oceania. Aloha, Ethan. Nice to see you. Um, you know, as we start this conversation today and try to think through some of these ideas around Black visuality and solidarity in Oceania, I think it'd be really wonderful for us and the audience to um, learn more about each of us as moderators and how we're coming to this work. So I wonder if you would be able to give us um, just a little um, window into how you've come to be connected to this conversation. Um, here in the Pacific, genealogy is very important. Um, the idea of, of connection and ancestry is also extremely important in the African diaspora. I think it's appropriate that we start um, by introducing ourselves and the genealogies that have brought us to this conversation. So could you talk a little bit about how you situate yourself um, as a scholar, as a professor, as a media maker in connection with the topic of today's panel? 
Certainly. And thanks again, Kimmy. I always like having these kind of conversations both with you and, you know, just, you know, a large, larger, even general audience. Um, but folks that don't know, um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii Manoa, uh, teaching in the ethnic studies department. Um, also a collaborator with Paulina Sessions, um, a media making group um, that looks at critical ways to um, investigate identity, culture, race, and more um, throughout Hawaii and Oceania. Um, but a lot of my work really centralizes around, in some ways, genealogy, the kind of connections that I have um, throughout my life, as well as what it means to be Black um, beyond the continent. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we're thinking about genealogy, you know, I reflect back on my own family's legacy. On my dad's side, much of the family comes from Texas and Louisiana. And after a certain point from there, we can't go any further because of slavery. Whereas on my mom's side, um, the genealogy and family lines run through both Japan as well as Korea, uh, which means there is that colonial component to it. And I think the way these come together, you know, especially in my own work, is through militarism. You know, and much of what I investigate um, with my academic work um, and also some of my photography work is the sort of intersection between Blackness and militarism. What happens when we are looking at Black folks who join the military and experience the military, but more specifically abroad. How does that change the way they're thinking about race, nationhood, gender, and more? But even more so, what happens when these sort of dynamics between being an oppressor or a settler also come into conflict with being Black? And, you know, for me, you know, in some ways that's personally driven, you know, being a military brat, as folks like to phrase it, um, being raised partially in Okinawa, but also having these sort of uh, militarized lineages that extend to Korea, Okinawa, California, and more. But then also, you know, it's had an impact on what I bring to the conversation um, and how I create some of the works um, that I've done, whether it's doing photography in Okinawa or also the more of the filmmaking side uh, when it comes to Pahana sessions. And I think, you know, it, be kind of, it becomes a crucial sort of uh, endeavor to not only think about how Blackness gets visualized in those sort of ways, but also the meanings behind the visuals, whether it's from the creation side or even from the performative side from uh, the people that are around us. For me, um, you know, I think like you, we, we don't have the same uh, lineage that have, has brought us here, but some very similar kind of parallel tracks that have brought us here. Um, for those that don't know, I am the executive director and the founder of the Popola Project. And we are um, kind of a, a hybrid type of institution here in Hawaii. We're a very small a community organization that has, as part of its work, um, creating new representations of Blackness here in Hawaii and across our region. And I came to this work kind of through a circuitous route. Um, I'm a linguist by training and I've been doing a lot of work in indigenous language revitalization across the Pacific and across North America. Um, my own ancestors are people um, from, from Africa, formerly enslaved people, um, indigenous North American people, folks from Southern China, um, some Europeans as well. Um, and a lot of my, my interest in language revitalization came from um, my indigenous background, uh, indigenous North American background, being very kind of introduced to the ideas of colonization in a very visceral, personal way um, through some of my family's relationships to um, federal recognition and state recognition in North Carolina. And finding language and culture as one of the media for uh, one of, some of the media for people to kind of claim who they were. And certainly for me, as somebody who is of African and indigenous North American background, visuality is a huge part of how people kind of check on uh, your authentic claims to your own identity and your own family, um, but also police those. So um, certainly, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot um, in my experience is people deciding whether or not you belong in a particular category based on what you look like. And I think as a scholar, um, even though I'm a linguist and, and interested in words and sound, um, the visual is very much a part of that. The visual is absolutely part of language and communication. And so this conversation, I think, really intrigues me um, living here in Hawaii for the time that I have, last several decades, and thinking about um, not only my kuleana as someone who's living in occupied place, 
as someone who is the product of um, you know, colonization in some ways through my own lineage, um, someone who is the descendant of people who are trafficked and enslaved and indigenous people who are dispossessed of land, what it means to be here, but also how concepts of race have made it hard for us to see stories that are also here and really important stories that help us understand not only the history of what has actually happened, but the possibility for all of us around the world to get free and to reconnect with ourselves and our humanity in important ways. So I'm really excited about this, this particular conversation. Um, in our work at the Pol Polo Project, we are really interested in representations of Blackness that feel true and that honor our humanity and the diversity of our different identities and expressions. And um, as a media maker, filmmaker, and, um, and as a scholar, I'm, I'm very curious about where this conversation might lead us. Hello, my God, go everyone. My name is Moses Goods. I am a Black, Native Hawaiian, and a queer theater artist, originally from the island of Maui, but now based here in Honolulu. Moses, thank you so much for joining us as part of this uh, panel and important discussion to have about Black visuality and solidarity in Oceania. Uh, I was wondering, actually, if you could dive a little deeper uh, for us into um, your genealogy a little bit. You know, I know you've shared a little bit about where you're from, but you know, if you could Talk to us a little bit about being Black, Native Hawaiian, but then also what is Blackness to you? How did you, how have you experienced it as you come across it, you know, in the different spaces that you're in, as well as how are you read in these spaces as well as in the spaces that you uh, share your creations? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, when I think about, about what Blackness is, you know, when I introduce myself, I said that I'm Black, I'm Native Hawaiian, I'm queer, and those are, I guess, you know, some of the, the main with tributaries or, or streams that flows into what, what this is, right? And so blackness is, is a huge part of that. It feeds, it feeds my identity, who I am. It, 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 shaped, it helps to shape my understanding of, of the world around me. Um, I'm black on my dad's side, though we grew up here in Hawaii, on Maui, like I said. And you know, we, were all, we were on Maui even more so than here there are very few black families there. And, you know, sometimes I felt like we were the only black family. And sometimes in class, I was the only black, you know, um, kid in class. And so my dad, my dad saw that, he knew that, and he wanted to um, make sure that we identified with who we are as black people, even though we didn't, we didn't, we weren't growing up in that environment. We were growing up in, in um, on Maui. So we, had, we were surrounded by, you know, that culture, our culture here, but, Blackness is something that he had to make sure was instilled in us. And so I, I look at blackness as something that is just, um, like I said, a huge, a huge, something that shaped who I am and continues to. Moses, I want to ask you about how you are kind of experiencing blackness as a performer. So, so much of your, your work is on the stage and, and creating, crafting stories as a playwright as well. And I'm curious, you know, as a, as a performer, I've seen so much of your work over the many years um, engaging with Native Hawaiian history and the history of this place. Um, and a, a thing that's very striking to me seeing you perform is the way that the, the way that you inhabit your body, the way that you move, the way that you speak, um, the ways that, that you look are so integral to many of the stories that you tell too. And I'm curious, you know, as a, as a Black Native Hawaiian queer person, um, how you experience your body either as a performer offering the interpretation to your audience or um, how you experience the audience reacting to you as a performer. Yeah, you know, with my work, like you said, you, you see, you've seen a lot of my work or you've seen some of my work and it's mostly work that um, is centered on Native, Native Hawaiian culture and, and, and stories and history. And it's only recently that I've, um, made the decision to do what I, I had already knew I was going to do eventually, which is to include other parts of who I am into my creative body of work. Um, so I, I started with, with Native Hawaiian work because we're in Hawaii and that's, that's in my opinion, that's, what you, that's where I should start. Um, but always knowing that eventually I'll, I'll include other parts of me. But it's interesting, I don't know if this answers your question, but it's, I, I, it's something I, try, I don't like to think about is maybe other reasons for why that is. Um, why, I, why only now in my 40s am I including that other part of who I am, specifically um, the black side of who I am. 
And I guess part of me doesn't want to admit, but I, I, I know it's there. I'm cons- I w- it was a concern, you know, about how people would, would, would take that, you know, seeing me as an established Native Hawaiian artist and now putting something else into the work that I do. It was just something, I don't know if I was scared of it by any means, but it was, it was, it was a concern. I, 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 I wondered what, how people would, would take that. And just the other day, I have some friends that live down the street and they're artists as well. And they wanted me to, uh, to include me in one of their conversations. But a question was, well, I don't see you as, as this because in, in your work, I see this. And I said, well, you haven't seen this, this other piece of work that just came out that, that includes that. But I have different parts of me and, and people, I guess the difficult thing is people want to see one thing. It's easier for them to see one thing. And it's hard when you, when you are many things and you want to put that into your work and even creating work that includes my entire self is a difficult thing. And so I think for me, it was a good idea to take it step by step, you know, include, do work on who I am as, as, as a Native Hawaiian, as a Black person, as a queer person. At some point, I may, I may come up with a piece that is able to include all of that, but just from, I think from, um, the, 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 I guess the only way for me to do that was to do it slowly, step by step, thinking about myself and creating how I would create that work and also people that, that view my work and, and want to understand who I am as an artist. They just got to come along the journey with me and, and watch my, my career evolve because um, it's, it's not easy to do all at once. I don't know if any of that made sense, but that's my answer. <laughs> No, it definitely makes sense, you know, and I appreciate you being, you know, very honest and forthcoming as you're talking about these different tributaries, you know, and flows. What experiences have you had around those moments of understanding or misunderstanding? And, and I'm also interested in the title of this panel is about solidarity um, and, and thinking about where you might see connection points between Native Hawaiian culture, um, struggles and, and Black struggles as well. You know, growing up, I, I, I realized that the extent of, of most people's knowledge of, of Black culture is from, you know, television and media and sports, you know, figures and whatnot. You know, we had, we had, um, we had th- something that happened, two things that happened that I thought was a great opportunity for connections to, to, to happen, to be made. And that was, you know, we had the, the, the big protests that happened. Um, the first one was the, the, the protest that happened on, on the Mauna and where Hawaiians were just came together in, in a way that had not happened in my lifetime. And it was one of the most beautiful things that I experienced to be able to feel the entire Lahui be, come together and feel like we're one. And I'm like, wow, we were, I felt just on top of a mountain, like literally we were, it was, it was incredible. And then the second, the, the, the second movement was the Black Lives Matter movement which I am also so fortunate to have been a part of. It's, it's, it's something that, that is, has caused change to happen a, a, in a huge and profound way. And in a, in a perfect world, you know, both sides, you know, would, 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 would then understand each other. And that, 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 could, that could cause um, beautiful connections. And I think it has for some, some parts of the community. But in other parts of the community, it served um, in the opposite direction because it 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 became two two things viewed in particular the the Hawaiian many many people a part of the the um, movement on the Mona looked at only the violence that that ensued with the Black Lives Matter movement, and it became something that actually. Um, further divided because I think there is a divide between who blackness and, and native Hawaiian um, communities to a degree in, in, in depending on who, you, who you're again talking to. It sort of um, was starting to, to drive a further wedge, which was very frustrating to me because I'm, I understand both and they're not meant to be the same and you can't try to expect one to, to be like the other, yet that was happening and there was, there was a sense of, and again, not er- everyone by any means, but there was a sense of, from some people, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Our, our kupuna would never do that. Look at our, our protest, it was peaceful and yours is, is, is violent. And 
and we don't we want nothing to do with that. And so I, I think I don't know. I, I do see opportunities for for um for connection. I mean that's why that's why I do the work that I do, right? But I guess what I'm saying is just, it's frustrating when things happen a certain way and and you don't have control over people's minds and it just I don't know. Sometimes it just uh, frustrating things happen. Sorry, I don't know if that answers your question either. <laughs> No, it definitely does. And I appreciate you, you know, putting yourself, you know, putting forth these ideas out there. And you're saying you, you're, you know, it's also one of the reasons why you do the work you do. Can you take us through some of the work that you do? Um, but one thing, you see, when you asked me that question in this particular conversation about blackness in Oceania, I have to um, talk about, uh, I guess, what that means to me growing up or rather uh, I'll fast forward to, it was um, 2012, and it was my first um, trip into Oceania other than Hawaii. We went to the Solomon Islands for the Festival of Pacific Arts and getting off the plane, the first thing we saw was this beautiful performance that, were, that was put on for all the delegations and the dancers were black like they were black and it, it blew my mind because I, and they, they are of the Pacific. They are Pacific Islanders and, and dark skin black people. And I, I, I didn't know what to make of that because I grew up here not really feeling like blackness was a part of where I grew up other than my, my family and our insular situation on Maui. It was never, I, I, I didn't even know that my my ancestors on my my mom's side, my Hawaiian side, that that we come from that, that we are connected to that. It just my my brain never registered that I, until that moment, and this was you know only what 2012. This this is not not too long ago, and it's in my adult life that I realized that there even was blackness in Oceania. So to answer your question, I think we were in a very good position to talk about that, but I think we have a long way to go because how did I grow up? How did I spend my entire life here? not realizing how much a part of Oceania blackness really was in a different way than what I know, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm African American black, but it is still a part of, of Oceania. And I didn't know that. And so I, I, I and on one hand, I was like, so excited to see that in the Solomon Islands. But on the other hand, I'm like, wait a minute, what did not happen in my lifetime that needs to happen now for us to really be able to have the conversation you know, about what, about racism, about, about blackness, about, you know, um, really being a melting pot, which Hawaii is, but I think it's not the perfect melting pot because nowhere is right now. There's always, always things we got to talk about, things, you know, we got to, we got to work on, but that is one in particular that, yeah, we're doing pretty good in Hawaii, but there are some things that we, we still got to do, I think, and we are, we are, I have anything to do with it. <laughs> I'm curious about what you might have to do with it. You know, the, that story about going to the Solomon Islands and seeing these Black people, these Pacific Islander people who you can recognize as fully both and legitimately both in that moment, um, you know, inspiring you and, and causing you to kind of reflect on your own experience as, a, as an Indigenous Pacific Islander and as a Black person, though connected through African American heritage. Um, are there, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, in how that experience might be shaping the work that you're producing now. Are there ways that that experience has kind of opened up questions for you, further questions, or things that you're exploring that might be impacting um, how your work is developing right now? Since then, uh, and it's really within the year that I finally made this decision to include Blackness in my work, um, I've, I've um, created some pieces, I've been able to connect nationally with other artists and other theaters and create work with them. For me, I'm, I'm in the middle of, of exploring not who I am as a Black person, because I know, I know what that is, I know who I am, but what that looks like in the work that I'm creating. And it's a new thing for me, but it is something that I've been thinking for a very long time about, you know, how when I do incorporate this into my, in, in my, my creative work, what is it going to look like? So um, to be continued, there's going to be more, you know, on that in, in, in my work. I'll be looking out for that, but yeah. The concept of uli uli is, is black or dirty. And, uh, and the idea of fakafisi, fakafisi means any, anything that is Fijian. 
is derogatory. Adultery is fakafisi. Stealing is fakafisi. And so, I mean, these are the, the complexities, some of the complexities of how blackness is conceptualized. And so, having said that, let me, let me say something controversial, and that is, you know, the issue of blackness is not something that is necessarily created by the colonizer. They institutionalize it. But these ideas are inherent in our cultures. Ponipate, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. You know, as we get started, we want to um, kind of situate ourselves. And, um, you know, as, as you know, and I'm sure I've experienced many places in the Pacific, um, sharing our genealogy is very important for establishing who we are and also where we are. And I wonder, um, as a professor and as someone a part of this larger conversation, how you see the genealogy that you come from intellectually, culturally, personally, connecting you to this conversation on Black visuality and solidarity. When we talk about Blackness in Oceania, the very minute we talk about Blackness, we are limiting the scope of the discussion to Melanesia and Melanesians. This is because, um, as you know, in the 1830s, uh, uh, the French explorer, Orville um, Dumont, Orville Dumont, you know, um, sort of uh, categorized the Pacific, as we all know, into Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia. And Melanesia simply means dark-skinned people. So, and that has informed the subconscious and the conscious and the national consciousness of nations in the Pacific, in Oceania that uh, blackness, when you talk about blackness, you're talking about Solomon Islanders, Solomon Islanders, New Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, West Papua, New Caledonia, Zenitao, Kea of Fiji. Uh, this is because Polynesia is not black. When I talk about blackness as an Itao Kei and as a Melanesian, my notion of blackness is intertwined with my identity as an indigenous Fijian, as an indigenous Fijian. So blackness and indigeneity to me intertwined. Um, and as in it, okay, you know, I come from the clan of the Matani Vanua, the spokesman. That's my genealogy. I speak today as in it, okay. And also as a chief spokesman. And as a chief spokesman, you know, uh, one of the traditional roles and responsibilities of being a traditional spokesman of the chief is to is to fight and advocate for fairness and justice and this is very important when we talk about the notion of blackness you know as we all know that black lives matter the recent um, you know uh, reignition of black lives matter very recently you know uh, following the, the the murder of george floyd has uh, sparked the discussion on blackness and all of a sudden Every community in the Pacific, you know, instantly, you know, stand up and associate themselves with blackness. But you know, that in itself is disingenuous. We have to really unpack this notion of blackness in the Pacific. That when we talk about blackness in the Pacific, you're not talking about Tongans, you're not talking about Samoans, neither are you talking about the native Hawaiians or the Maoris of New Zealand. Blackness are someone like me who is black skinned. And, uh, and, and so my notion of blackness is associated with indigeneity as well. But also, you know, um, how do I get connected to this discussion on the issue of blackness? And so to me, blackness is someone who's not only black skinned, was not only former slaves, both in the context of uh, transatlantic slavery and black birding, but someone who is also, you know, uh, dispossessed of their land, excluded, marginalized, economically marginalized. Someone who inhabits the economic margins of society, and it okay, are not an exception. So uh, my notion of blackness is complicated because of the, of, the, of the complexity of where I, I am situated, both as an indigenous Fijian and a Melanesian. Being uh, black and indigenous Fijian and Melanesian, um, and also someone that's gone from Fiji to Hawaii to now the Bay Area, 
how do you think your conception of blackness has changed in these different spaces that you've been in? Um, and if you don't mind just also sharing like how have you been read in these various spaces, whether it's um, when you share your creations, whether it's as you interact with your students and more. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, um, blackness is different, right? And I've articulated my perspective on that. Now, when you talk about black, black experiences, this is where we can all identify ourselves with. You know, whether you are black skinned or, or you know, or, or light skinned Polynesians, because when you talk about black experiences, there is a collective experiences of being marginalized, right? And, um, and, and to me, you know, this marginalization, the marginalization of blackness, in terms of when, when we articulate the common experiences of blackness, what are these? Ex exploitation, slavery, subjugation, you know, denigration, you know, uh, um, the indoctrination of, it, of uh, an ethnocentric curriculum, right? And so that when, you know, uh, I came out of an education system uh, that I'm trying to decolonize myself from is that you become, edu you, you, you were educated in, in the velo system, in the culture, in everything about the West, right? And so that is, that is the experiences of being black. And so, um, as a professor in the Bay Area, you know, I taught at the University of Hawaii in here, when I think about my course syllabus and my pedagogy, I think about it in terms of a colonized, someone who's colonized, someone who has, uh, who has experience, experiences of subjugation, of exclusion, of exploitation that other communities of color experience. And so there is a common experience of evisceration, the denigration of a people. And so um, I, I connect in that regard. I connect with students that comes from community of color. And I don't just talk about experiences of exclusion, of marginalization, of denigration from an intellectual academic point of view. I talk about it experientially as someone who experienced firsthand, you know, the kinds of economic exclusion as a result of the 96 years of British colonial rule in Fiji, for instance. And so that's the connection. I talk to them as a colonized, marginalized, eviscerated, denigrated, exploited person of color, regardless of whether I'm Polynesian and Melanesian. That's the transcending, you know, factor that transcends, that connects. And then that is a discussion that needs to be encouraged in Oceania because it brings together solidarity. Because if we just talk about blackness, then there is fragmentation. In fact, it brings, you know, histories and experiences of, um, of anger, right? And uh, that I went through, you know, I went to the University of South Pacific as a Fijian, you know, the way, you know, I've been treated because I'm, I'm Melanesian, I'm Fijian. Blackness is associated with witchcraft and poverty and Polynesians use that. I mean, and I say this unapologetically, it's something that we need to talk about and unpack and, and, and you know, and, and and just and get rid of. We need to dismantle that. And so, you know, but 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 when you talk about black experiences, it's it's a uniting force because whether you are Asian American or Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, you know, African Americans, Fijian, Tom and Samoans, we associate ourselves. With it. it resonates with us. There's something that hurts us when we talk about with the common experiences of exclusion marginalization, the impact of colonization in our lives. How do you think this sort of solidarity can be formed? What do you think is the role of, say, us as academics, for example, the classroom, the visual media, such as film, stage performance, and more? How do you think this can be used yeah. to create those you know, lines of solidarity, whether it's in Oceania, whether it's on the continental United States and even more. 
you know, Candy's book, The 400 Souls, is going to come out soon, and I look forward to purchasing the book. I say that to say this, that, you know, for me, you know, as an academic, as, as a professor, um, I incorporate that in my Pacific studies. You know, a good two, two weeks to study about transatlantic slavery, to study about the history of slavery in this country, in this world that we live in. And so by teaching that, so that, you know, because when you watch movies like uh, Amazing Grace and read, uh, you know, the work of uh, Candy, for instance, you realize that this is, you know, this is a different history. This is something that we need to educate ourselves with. And so to me, the response, building solidarity is to teaching it teaching Black Lives Matter, teaching the history of transatlantic slavery, teaching it as it is, exposing students to understand this, that when, you, when, you, when you're teaching and learning about Pacific studies, it's just not about Pacific studies. You need to draw experiences of, you know, of, of marginalization and denigration. And I keep using this word evisceration because you know, it, it resonates with me. You know, to eviscerate is to take a fish and gut it and take the life out of it. Because that's what happens during colonialism, you know? Um, and so to me as an academic, building solidarity is to teaching about it, raising awareness about it in, in my class, in my, in my organization, you know, in my community, right? And, 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 you know, and, and go on from there. To me, solidarity begins with my responsibility is teaching it, raising awareness about Black Lives Matter in the classroom after we understand the extent of it. We may not probably understood the extent of it, but having some kind of understanding of the magnitude of slavery and colonialism that African-Americans experience, then we can then say, okay, this is what happens here, this is what happens in Oceania. There are common experiences of Blackness that we all face. And so to me, that begins the work of solidarity. So that when the Tongan of Fijian, you know, takes up Black Lives Matter banner, he or she understands exactly where to begin and where to end, the context, the historical context of what it means to support Black Lives Matter, of what it means to identify themselves with African-Americans and with other communities of color that have similar experiences of colonization. Thank you for, for lending your, your intellect and your heart to this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. We forget the foundation which our ancestors has laid down for us. And I can tell you this as a Maroon, and I speak on behalf of the Maroon people, who will fight with every last breath in our body to ensure set, serve it, and keep it. Chant the jump day and night and root the ancestors them from down in the abbas until we make sure so the cockpit steer for the band and the unborn. Hi everyone, I'm Esther Figueroa. I'm an independent filmmaker, writer, educator, and linguist. I am from Jamaica, from family of Jamaicans, but I grew up in Jamaica. United Kingdom, US, Puerto Rico, and I spent uh, 25 years based in Hawaii. So um, here I am. My most recent um, documentary feature is called Fly Me to the Moon, which um, launched in 2019. And it's about modernity um, through a discussion of the global aluminum industry. Um, including a section on Jamaica, which most people don't realize is central to the aluminum industry. But it, it looks at the world and how we're all connected. And um, as I say, having to do with the film that on planet Earth, everything is connected. I'm curious because I think, you know, as I'm listening to you speak about that, I'm also then curious about how you connect some of those perspectives to your work and how you connect it to this larger idea of the panel about Black visuality and solidarity? Well, I think for me, Blackness and identity are not the same thing. So 
for me, there is blackness that exists outside of human identity and blackness that is entangled within human identities. Uh, for me, the primacy of non-human blackness is pull, the cosmic darkness out of which all life is created and also the darkest night that connects us to our stardust beginnings. And for me, I resent that modern society has taken darkness away, that it becomes nearly impossible to experience darkness because of the human fear of erasure that darkness brings and our material and metaphorical obsession with light and whiteness. And one of the reasons I deeply love and respect parts of Hawaii Island is because there you can still experience pull. When you experience night in the land of Pele, the creator, you experience everything beyond the human scale, expansive time before human existence and planet Earth as a minuscule part of an unknown universe. In terms of human identity, I grew up, you know, I was born in Jamaica, which has a vastly majority black um, population. So for me, blackness in terms of human beings is just the normal default humanity. In terms of my own experience, in terms of you know um, identity, um, whether blackness was projected or rejected onto my body, meaning whether I was considered black or not black, um, it has always othered me one way or the other, and I've never belonged um, or been a member of any any community or any identity in that sense. I'd like to jump in here. You, you said some very evocative things uh, in response to that last question. And I'm, I'm thinking about your response in the context of your work as a filmmaker and as someone who relishes the darkness of Paul and the creative um, kind of generative power of darkness, um, but also working as a filmmaker, um, presenting images, moving images. And I'm curious how you've kind of come to that work. You mentioned that you're a linguist and you're a filmmaker. Um, you also have lived in many places and don't necessarily see yourself rooted, but how has film become a medium for you to do some of this exploring work or showing work that you've done over the many years? My first degree is in history. My second degree is in East Asian languages and literatures. Chinese was my major, which I did at UH Manoa. And my third degree, my PhD is in linguistics, which I did at Georgetown as a sociolinguist. So it was really when um, my partner, Heather Hanani Jr. at that time, we were together in Washington, DC and she wanted to move home to Hawaii. And so I came to Hawaii and because of my background um, in kind of a colonial situation, where we were fighting against coloniality. When I came to Hawaii, one of the first things I noticed was that television and film and almost all medium, media um, both erased native Hawaiians, but also local culture. There was nothing, it was, you know, at that point it was uh, the networks, you know, and everyone was watching the same American um, production. <laughs> And so that was when um, Heather and I started Gina Roa Productions and we created the first um, Hawaiian television series that was on both commercial and public television, um, A Mau Anakaheo, Enduring Pride. So it was kind of through my, my reading of Hawaii as a colonial occupied um, space that I got involved in, in in producing media that had to do with um, what was then the Hawaiian movement um, to reclaim language, culture, all those sorts of things, but also um, as a counter to mainstream media, basically. I'm curious, you know, I, I've seen some of the work that you've done in other parts of the Pacific outside of Hawaii, um, the Islands of Globalization series um, to me is, is you know, speaking to the solidarity, the potential of solidarity, how do you find your work um, contributing to these conversations? How do you find your work being a part of, of building solidarity? As you say, everything on this earth is connected. So um, how does your work factor into that? In terms of solidarity, um, you know, the notion of solidarity across Oceania, or across the world or whatever, 
you know, at this point where we are in life, I think it's very important that we actually have solidarity with trees, you know, solidarity with the soil, solidarity with water, solidarity with air, solidarity, um, you know, with microbes, you know. So I think always just talking in terms of um, human reality and human relationships is really not only missing the moment that we live in, but kind of missing the stream that we are in and have been from the beginning of time. Um, part of the work I've done in Jamaica um, has been for about 20 years or so trying to stop bauxite mining in a particular part of the island called Cockpit Country. And um, one of the short films I did as part of the movement um, is called Cockpit Country is Our Home. And it's, it, it gives literal voice to Cockpit Country. Um, a, a resident of Cockpit Country who un unfortunately has now passed, Asperger, who has a beautiful gravelly voice starts off by saying, I am Cockpit Country and proceeds from there. Um, and then the different animals that are in the film um, were all voiced by children and adults from the community. Um, and they all speak in the I am and Coptic countries are home. And so I think that um, this notion of voice and um, this notion of kinship um, for me is very much um, important. And so when we look at Oceania and we talk about centering Oceania, I think one of the things to center is the fact that, of course, um, Moana Nui, the, the, the ocean that we call the Pacific, is the largest body of anything on the planet. And so you can't talk about Oceania without centering the ocean. Hello, well, everyone. Welcome to the live portion of our conversation this afternoon. I want to thank all of our panelists who we'll introduce shortly, um, but would like to start this engagement that we have with you this afternoon with a couple of acknowledgments. The beginning of the pre-recorded piece, um, my colleague Ethan Caldwell acknowledged that we are broadcasting to you from occupied Hawaii. And as you've heard from our panelists, it's very important that we acknowledge the lands and peoples that we come from as a way to situate ourselves. Um, it's a way that we contextualize ourselves and understand, but also how we contribute to this conversation today. I also want to acknowledge our ancestors. And as Esther Figueroa just said, you know, thinking about our kinship, not only with humans, but also the plants and animals that we're connected to. Um, I want to acknowledge our ancestors, known and unknown, in the, in the lands that we can name and the lands that we cannot. And especially I want to acknowledge the ancestors of the people in this conversation this afternoon, people from Africa and its long and many waves of diaspora, people of the Pacific, brave voyagers. I want to acknowledge all of our people who have contributed to our being here and being a part of this conversation today, um, who have been resilient in the movements around the globe, who are ancient before there were ever concepts of blackness, um, before any of us or our, our lineages spoke this English language, um, and people who are here and human after slavery, after colonization, still defending our lands and our lives, and now, today, and going forward, imagining new navigations for our futures and beyond. So I wanna thank you all for being here for this conversation this afternoon, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Ethan Caldwell, to introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Right. Thank you, Kemi. Um, so um, to go through, as we transition to this next part, I'd like to introduce the panelist. Uh, our first panelist is Moses Goods, who is one of Hawaii's most prominent theater artists. Moses is the founder and artistic director of in a Mona uh, theater company dedicated to reintroducing the native stories of Hawaii to the community. His body of work is strongly rooted in native Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian culture. Um, next is Dr. Ponipate Okalekutu, uh, who's an assistant professor of college, uh, at the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. His research focuses on the relationship between colonialism and land alienation and the subsequent marginalization of indigenous peoples. And Finally, um, I'd like to also introduce Dr. Esther Figueroa, who is a Jamaican independent filmmaker, writer, educator, and linguist with over 35 years of media productions, including television programming, documentaries, educational videos, multimedia, and feature films. Figueroa's films are screened and televised all over the world and are taught at numerous universities and include 
Jamaica for Sale from 2009, the award-winning feature documentary about tourism and unsustainable development, and her latest feature documentary, Fly Me to the Moon, about modernity and the global aluminum industry. And I'd like to welcome all the panelists to this talk. And before we get to this uh, larger group discussion, I also want to remind all of our attendees that you're welcome to share your questions and thoughts in the Q&A box um, of the chat as well. Thank you, Ethan, and welcome to all of our esteemed panelists. It's wonderful to see you all live um, and all in one place. Um, you know, these, the conversations that um, have led into this moment have been so rich. And we've been playing with some really complex concepts, blackness, um, indigeneity, um, solidarity itself, I think is a really complex thing for us to be thinking through. To start our conversation today, I'd love to hear from each of you um, as you're listening to your other colleagues on this panel, are there things that are um, kind of sparking your imagination as we think through solidarity? Um, as I mentioned, I love that, that line from Esther about thinking about our solidarity beyond the human um, and beyond the right now. And I'd love to hear um, how you folks are thinking about solidarity and the possibility for solidarity through, with, because of blackness that we are connected by. We'll start with you, Esther. Looks like you're <laughs> ready to go. Okay, well, thanks. Um, and it's just wonderful to be with um, all of you. And um, I, the issue of solidarity, I think that one of the things is that we're in an existential moment of, um, and so I think it's very important that when we think about solidarity, people often ask, well, what can a person do, et cetera? And I think that solidarity, if it's just an extension of yourself, then it's a form of narcissism. So for me, I think it's important to ask, why do you have solidarity? What's the purpose and what is it good for? So in terms of blackness and Oceania, right now, the, the people of Papua, you know, we again have ecocide and genocide going on where the people are being exterminated and removed um, for large plantations of palm oil or extraction in Papua New Guinea, you know, with neocolonialism. And of course we have Kanaki, you know, which is this incredible French settlement, you know, um, all based on extraction and the Solomon Islands um, where, you know, the, the fish is being sucked out of the sea. Um, and then of course, Fiji, um, you know, um, where there is bauxite mining going on as we speak, just like Jamaica and Fiji and Jamaica, we have long tentacles of British colonialism and, in, in, you know, and then Australia, when you talk about Black Lives Matter is, you know, the incarceration of Aboriginal people. So I think that, um, it's not enough to care about other people because you have a sense of familiarity that we share blackness or oppression or denigration or whatever it is. But if it's more than a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, narcissism, then what does it lead to? And what, what concretely does it, you know, um, are we able to intervene like we intervened with um, apartheid in South Africa? You know, that was an example of global solidarity of which Jamaica, for example, was a leader. Can we intervene in what's happening in Papua and Kanaki and all these other places, you know? Um, we're, we're at an existential moment where people are dying, you know? You know, for me, I, I guess I can only speak from my my experience, and you know, from the the interview you I mentioned, growing up on Maui, and how I often just felt like the only black person in many circles, and um, you know, it. it but then when when I would see the occasional black face, a black another black face in school or around me, there was just. It, there was this need to want to to want to connect because I didn't see that other than you know the faces in my family, and I, I think you know and then and then when I went to the Solomons and I saw other I, I saw people that like uh, Tony Pate says in his identified where indigeneity and blackness 
are intertwined, which which made me a little emotional because that has not been my my experience. But you know, it, 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 sorry, of course, when I talk, there's a leaf blower going down the street. Isn't that always how it is? Anyway, um, it's just it. It starts with I, I see what you're saying, Esther, and I certainly I, I agree with you absolutely. But it, it, it does start with with ourselves. I, I mean, for me, I needed to be a little selfish and and think about myself because I was trying to find ways to protect myself because I was in a in in a, uh, an environment where I didn't have solidarity and I wanted that so much for selfish reasons because I needed it. You know, um, I'm to a different point now in my adult life when you know I understand what solidarity is. I I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, but I think that's that's sort of what, at least for me and for many people I would imagine, gets us, um, pushes us in, in the direction of understanding what solidarity is and, and, and trying to think about why we need solidarity. And I think for me, it was healing, you know, it was, it was safety and it, it did start within, within myself. I, I, I think, um, um, first of all, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here and to join you in this uh, important conversation. Uh, to me, the notion of solidarity, um, uh, and I speak as, as a Melanesian and uh, an indigenous Fijian, isn't it okay? That is, uh, first of all, you know, the, the question, what do, what do I see as a Melanesian? Or is an Ita okay? How do I see, how do I see blackness in Hawaii and the Pacific? Right? Um, you know, uh, Esther talks about the issue of existentiality. We all have the existential, you know, the existential threat of climate change. We also have the existential threat of institutional racism. We also have the existential threat of um, of an economic system, an economic system, capitalism, an economic system that thrives on the exploitation of communities of color, an, uh, an economic system that thrives on the exploitation of the ecosystems of people of color as well. And so, um, so let me uh, let me sort of uh, very quickly um, sort of articulate what I see uh, as black visuality in Ocean and Hawaii. When I see Hawaii, I see an occupied space. I see the disenfranchisement of Kanaka Maoli, the indigenous people of Hawaii. A kind, you know, disenfranchisement that entails one, land dispossession, two, economic exclusion, three, homelessness, four, you know, the absence, you know, the deprivation of human dignity, and five, the desecration of uh, spaces, sacred spaces, most notably Mauna Kea. I also see the denigration of Micronesians. These are Pacific Islanders who left Micronesia as, as a result of US militarism. The Micronesia, the Federated States of Micronesia, which include Yap, Kosrae, Ponape, and Chuk, uh, the Marshall Islands, uh, you know, Marianas. These are people who, who left their islands because it has been inundated, because it has been desecrated by military testing. It's unlivable land. So they came to Hawaii and then they're denigrated as well. You know? And so they denigrated in their, in their original indigenous spaces. And when they come to a place in Hawaii you know, to escape their, their as well you know, experience, different levels of racial denigration, stigmatization, and you know, all kinds of oppression. Uh, what do I see in Oceania, in West Papua, as uh, you know, Esther mentioned, um, you know, uh, the fight for self-determination in the midst of human rights abuse, the dispossession of land, you know, um, mutilation of bodies, mass massacres, and you know, um, that's what I see. And in the case of, uh, of Fiji, you know, uh, you know, again, Esther mentioned the exploitation of uh, in the environment through bauxite mining. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's also the economic exclusion of Itauke, whose land has been expropriated for real estate development, the sugar industry, and, uh, and you know, tourism as well. And so why is solidarity important? It is, 
in order for us, to me as an academic, as a teacher, uh, it is important to identify, to articulate that we have an enemy. There's, there are common enemies, the capitalist economic system, institutional racism, the existential threat of climate change. We need to be cognizant. We need, there needs to be a sense of urgency instilled in people of Eugenia. That this is not an intellectual conversation. This is not something you only learn in university. This is issue of existential threat that we need to understand how to, and the question is how do we navigate ourselves around this existential threat of the existential threat of climate change, of institutional racism, you know, of economic exploitation, of economic exclusion. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's my contribution to, to this question. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you for your responses. And I think, you know, as you all are highlighting you know, the different kind of intricacies surrounding the sharing of different stories, histories, politics, and spaces along solidarity, you know, it helps us also reimagine what this interconnectedness means, but also just how far we need to push in order to make that happen, both within our communities and outside. And so I'm actually curious, you know, if y'all could kind of speak to this a little bit um, in regards to what kind of unique challenges you face within your respective communities when it comes to creation and art that impact how you engage with black visuality and solidarity. And I think um, I'd actually like to bring in one of the audience questions right now um, that came up where one of the audience members is asking if uh, the panelists can speak a bit more about the experience of external perceptions or expectations for forming single identity and how that ties to how easily or not we're able to build solidarity if we stand more firm in the value of our multiplicitousness? Oh, that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, feel free to tackle it, you know, in any way you uh, care to. I'll defer to you, Esther. You're the expert. <laughs> On what? <laughs> Identity is always contingent. It's always multiplicitous. It's always, um, you know, um, we think of identity as something that is essential and that is within us, but actually you can think you are whatever you are and you can perform it. But if there's not an uptake from somebody else that accepts that identity, then actually you are not that thing. So, you know, Akemi as a linguist knows that, you know, um, the conversation, whatever you present, the performance of self has to be accepted by someone else. And so who we are is projected by other people. Other people decide whether, you know, um, you, you know, whether you're feminine or masculine or whether you're black or white or whether you're Asian or Pacific or whatever. And so you might, you might claim whatever identity you want to claim, but that, that identity only exists in the moment that somebody else projects that entity or accepts it upon you. So I think one of the issues why Moses, you know, I feel, I feel your pain and it's because you grew up in Hawaii, which is basically, you know, an American white supremacist occupied space and where um, there's a exceptionalism ar ar around Hawaiians and Hawaiian identity and Polynesia. The notions of Polynesia, Micronesia and Melanesia are racist notions. The majority of people in the Pacific are black, period, end. And so for you to live in the Pacific and not know that or realize that is because you live in a racist American place, you know? And then the colonial experience, you know, that Panipati experienced in Fiji, the colonial space where blackness denigrated. I mean, there, there's slavery in the Pacific, you know, that was called blackbirding. The sugar industry in Australia was based on the trafficking and enslavement of black Pacific Islanders, just like it, the sugar industry in other parts of the world. So we have these commonalities, but I think that if we only exist in these arguments about our commonalities of oppression and um, you know, are only seeing things in terms of the past, we're not really dealing with the moment and the future. And I think we have to deal with the moment and the future because it's urgent. 
Um, so unfortunately, I think many of these discussions and whatnot needed to take place about a century ago, and we need to catch up to the existential, existential threats that, you know, Panipati so brilliantly just, you know, concisely told us, you know, we, we have to, I, I understand the pain and whatnot, but we, we have to catch up very quickly. And it's because I, you know, I come from a society that is majority black that I have a completely different relationship to blackness than if you come from a society that that's just not the case. I mean, you know, you're just not surprised when doctors, lawyers, pilots, you know, whatever, prime ministers, whomever, everyone's black, you know, it's a different experience. I think the best way for me to answer that uh, that question is, I guess, share an experience that I had when I was, um, I travel a lot, or I used to travel a lot before the pandemic, and I, I would connect a lot with other theater artists, BIPOC theater artists all across the, the nation. And, and um, at one of these gatherings, there was um, a discussion, and the discussion led to um, uh, the facilitators having the, the artists that present kind of break off into different tables, and it ended up being okay um, the black theater makers will go to this table and then the Asian, you know, artists will go there and indigenous and whatnot, just to talk about, you know, things that, that their communities, issues their communities are going through. But then a number of us were like, well, hold up, I'm black and I'm indigenous. Where, what, what table, why you, I can't choose a table, right? And so the, the group of us were like, well, we need another table. They're like, oh, well, that wasn't you know, scheduled that we weren't planning for that, but go ahead and make a table, which we did, right? Um, I do recall though, looking around and I, no one voiced anything, but there was from the other artists, there was sort of like, what are they doing? They can't, they can't make their own table. I'm like, no, making your own table is what we need to, need to be happening, right? Because I'm not gonna identify with, with one thing because I'm made up of a bunch of different things and I'm always gonna go to that table where we're, we're mixed and we're not all mixed in the same way, but if you're gonna make us go to a table, that's what we're gonna do. So anyway, that's, that's my answer to that is, is, is form your own space, you know, form your own circles where that type of thinking is not a part of, of what, you're, what you're feeding yourself. You are surrounding yourself with people that are able to identify with this. What's the word you use? Multiplicit, multiplicitousness. Um, go to the multiplicitousness table is what I say. Mahalo, I think that's such an important and provocative part of our of our talk. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we we didn't actually acknowledge in having this conversation today is is the obvious, maybe to some people, but um, the comments in answer to this last question kind of I think remind us that that the concept of blackness, um, as has been said by many of our panelists, is a colonial concept. Um, when we talk about blackness incorporating people of the African diaspora, we're looking at flattening the, um, the specific identities of many people, um, whether we're talking about that in just in the United States and the African diaspora and certainly here in the Pacific. So part of what this, this panel is trying to get at is kind of teasing and playing around with those, those um, pieces of that multiplicitousness as our um, audience member asked us to consider um, we have some wonderful questions in the Q&A. So in the interest of time, we're gonna try to pull some of these together and keep our conversation moving. Um, there's a question uh, that's come from a couple different folks about um, exactly what, what Moses was just talking about. And this idea earlier alluded to of um, Moses, you mentioned your father worked to instill a kind of a black identity into your experience. And I'm thinking also of, of Esther and Ponipate reflecting on coming from societies where blackness is the norm. Um, and you see black people doing all sorts of things around you and you, in terms of numbers, but also in terms of the diversity of your social engagement. Um, one of the questions is asking um, for us as scholars, as media makers, performers, artists, um, what can we do in situations where um, young people in particular are being pushed into a space where they're encouraged or discouraged from connecting with other parts of their identity, whether it's um, gender, sexuality, cultural identity, um, and pushed into spaces where their kind of marginalized identity is primary. Are there ways that the work that we all do in our scholarship, our, our media making, um, can, can speak to that and kind of redirect 
and give people access to other ways to identify themselves or other ways to, to dream and imagine possibilities for themselves and their communities. You know, I, I, I'll go first on that. Um, uh, one of the, you know, um, the things that we do at the School of Ethnic Studies, I'm sure both in Hawaii and at the San Francisco State University and elsewhere where, you know, ethnic studies are taught. And that is, you know, um, centering curriculums and pedagogies on experiences, narratives, uh, you know, knowledge systems or epistemologies of communities of color. And that is just not, um, you know, uh, uh, ethnic identities. Uh, it's queer identities. It's all kinds of oppressed identities, all kinds of identities, you know, that um, in some ways ostracized. So you bring these identities and celebrate them. Uh, and you need to, you know, and I find it, uh, you know, as a, as a, you know, as a professor at, um, you know, both at the University of Hawaii, San Francisco State University, teaching students, you know, and, and, and centering my curriculum on narratives that comes from them, narratives, experiences, you know, um, and, and knowledge systems. Uh, it's powerful when you get them to celebrate who they are, you know, uh, um, and uh, to me, uh, you know, teaching and uh, uh, centering identity in academia in terms of teaching pedagogies, research is powerful, you know, uh, so that people can celebrate them, especially young generations to celebrate who they are, to, to feel accepted, uh, creating spaces in my classrooms where it becomes a space, not only, not only for learning, but uh, for healing where students feel free to express what they feel and what they think. Um, I, I find that, uh, you know, uh, uh, powerful. And thank you, Ponipate. I think uh, that contribution, especially when you're thinking about what we can do in the classroom and whatnot, you know, definitely forces us to then say, how are the different spaces that we're in, you know, also places that we can intervene, that we can also make changes occur, even if they're on a smaller scale or even larger scale. I think, you know, I appreciate your, you know, words, um, encouragement, you know, especially as we're thinking about the sort of actions that we can take. And, you know, I also want to then shift this a little bit. Um, to another question that you know we can have and um i'm curious you know to all the panelists to you you know i'm wondering what does the pacific and oceania as you're reflecting on the space you know the oceans the connectedness um what does the pacific and oceania offer us about blackness about challenges around it how it's even conceived and possibilities alongside indigeneity Well, I think for me, it, it, oh, oh, sorry, go no, Moses, go for it. Okay. Now, real quick, real quick. Um, for me, it just it just adds um, a whole nother layer of things that I that I really never considered when thinking about blackness, because again, blackness for me is, you know, from my, my dad's side and it's, it's, it's you know, African-American and 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 all all everything that comes with that. But just it, it's it's just. I think there's. And I don't want to speak for all Black people um, from from the continent, but you know there there there's there's uh, we get caught up in in the issues that we have as you know um, formerly enslaved people come from coming from from enslaved people um, from the transatlantic slave trade, and and the the anger and the frustration that 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 knowing that part of our history brings and it's going to bring it's always that anger is always going to be there and it, it, it just is it's a part of who we are it's, it's part of what our ancestors had to go through and we um again not speaking for all black people but we sort of claim blackness right and connecting with other black people like in oceania it's just a whole it's it's a whole nother layer and i don't want to say it complicates things but it just makes it much more there are things that, that you know we're not i'm not i don't I've never considered not having experience with with 
blackness in Oceania, other than what my, my own little world here. So if you had, to answer your question, what can I offer it? Just it's just expand. Like for me, it just expands my understanding of what blackness is. For me, I think it can lead us to exit um, the bind we're in, which is an inheritance that has nothing to do with, um, it has a very specific historical genealogy that we do not have to stay in. Mm -hmm. We do not have to give voice to, we do not have to give energy to. And for that, I say, look to the supposedly oldest continuous society in the world, the Aboriginal peoples of uh, what we call Australia, okay? 50,000, 60,000 years of consistency um, you know, um, people throughout, we, we can exit, we can get off this treadmill and, and consider from a completely different point of view, a completely different worldview, a completely different way of conceiving and being in the world. Of course, yes, because of colonialism, because of imperialism, because of settlement. But that has only been a few hundred years, a few hundred years compared to tens of thousands of years. We need to stop reproducing. We're too late. We need to stop reproducing, get off the treadmill and start from the places of people who have a completely different historical reality. Yes, we all share this colonial reality that we're in, but it's only a few hundred years. Modernity is only 500 years. You know, Hawaii has only been occupied for a few hundred years. Jamaica was a colony for 500 years, okay? There's still people who have not been quote unquote contacted, okay? So I think instead of reproducing the same, 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 which is another form of hegemony and Western imperialism, it allows us to exit and to start from somewhere else, start from a different foundation, a different reality and build from there rather than projecting this onto the rest of the world. Could I comment on, well, can I could just ask, I love that, I love that, that, that notion, but I, how do, how do how do I how would one do that? You know, it's it's my when um when Ethan introduced himself, he said that he could trace his genealogy back only so far, right? And that's it's to it's to the slaves, and it's that that is that's a part of of who I am, and I I, I cannot nor do I want to get rid of that. You know, and it, it's it's not it's not beautiful, but I don't have a connection to my ancestors hundreds and thousands of years ago on, on my father's side. On my mother's side, I do. I can trace my ancestors back to pole. I can actually do that. On my father's side, I can go back maybe a few generations. And so it's just, to me, it's just not that, why, that easy. But why to... would that interrupt your, why does that, that, that has nothing to do with other peoples in Oceania? I'm sorry. Well, my, my, the fact my, that you can't trace back ancestry on your family father's side has nothing to do with people in Oceania. So that uh, uh, don't bring that into the conversation is what you're saying. You don't have to. You can turn to. that off and 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 you know go back to the Solomon Islands and and learn from 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 you know. I, I made absolutely a film. I absolutely won't do that. I absolutely will not turn that off. That's what I'm trying to say. No, but, but you're, you're bringing that to something that is not their reality. It's my reality. So should I only bring part of my reality to these conversations? Well, I'm not, shut, I'm not... your, shut your reality down to learn from somebody else's reality. Oh, I have. I, that is my reality, too. I've got both realities. And both realities create the whole. So I, I'm not understanding what no, you're asking No, no, no. I'm saying that do. you're, don't bring your reality. Just listen and learn from other people's reality without foregrounding your reality is what I'm saying. You know, okay. I, I'd like to add um, to the conversation. I think, um, uh, and, and the question, if my memory serves me right, it, what does the discussion on blackness in Hawaii and Oceania offers to the whole discussion on blackness, um, you know, in the continental United States? I think uh, the, as I see it, I, I embrace both uh, Esther and Moses' uh, um, 
uh, sentiments that what the, the, dis, the, the, the experiences of blackness in Oceania, in Hawaii and Oceania, offers an interesting comparative and juxtapositional analysis that enriches the discussion. You know, um, and it is important. It is important that we draw from experiences elsewhere as, uh, as a basis of thinking of how do we navigate ourselves around this? How do we dismantle anti-blackness? And, and I think uh, it has to be, um, you know, foregrounded in, uh, you know, some kind of juxtapositional comparative analysis of, of how blackness is experienced in different places and spaces. But where in do you start? Where do you start? So if you start from, you know, the Western Academy and a genealogy of white supremacy leading to X, okay, then you're already framing it and you're already calling it in a particular way, okay? If you start somewhere else where someone doesn't know anything about that, okay? And they're talking in a different language and a, not just a different language as in, you know, a different linguistic language, but a different cognitive epistemology, ontology, completely different, okay? You know, Esther, if you, if you tell me a place that is completely devoid of any kind of conscious, consciousness on racism and, uh, you know, I'll go to that place, you no, know. No, it's, not a, it's not about not having consciousness of racism. It's about different ways of talking, a different stories, different narratives. Instead yeah, of having yeah. the hegemonic narrative that says it's this, 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 okay, stop. Okay, there, there, the, the way, for example, Apele talked about instead of seeing islands as separate, right? A sea of islands, or instead the sea connected, okay? That's a different way of seeing, right? Islands isolated, far away, instead the sea connected, okay? So what I'm talking about is instead of starting from a notion of blah, 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 I'm not saying that racism doesn't exist and structural. I'm saying that we don't have to always center the Euro-American um, experience, okay? Because it's not the dominant experience of the world, actually. It's a part of imperialism to always center it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yes, Esther, I, I hear you and I understand, you know, the decolonial advocacy that you're doing here to decolonize our mind from the hegemonic discussion that has sort of permeated, you know, every existence of our humanity. But in order to me, you know, in order for me to decolonize, I need to, I need to understand this and analyze it and have, you know, a deeper understanding of what is it that I'm decolonizing myself for. What is the alternative? And uh, yeah, I absolutely, you know, oh, I abs absolutely agree with the, you know, the decolonial mindset that you are, you know, advocating here. It's it's a complex discussion, but I, but I, I like the I like what you're saying, you know, to get rid of this and to 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 have a new slate, right? No, it's not. There's no such thing as a clean slate. It's a different slate. It's okay. Different yeah. 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 Slate. Right. Right. It's a different <laughs> slate. You know, but but you know, in order for me to get to 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 get to the different slate, I need to know this dirty slate. You know, this slate that is mud with blood, the blood of my people. I'd love to weigh in here just a little bit. Um, I think this is a really lively and important discussion. Um, thinking about the kind of framing that we've done for this panel, um, you know, I, I hear all of you and I really appreciate the heart that you're bringing to this conversation. And the reason that we invited all of you from very different backgrounds and experiences and ideas is to have this kind of exchange. And I think it's really productive um, for us to think about this stuff because as you have all said, this is an existential question. 
this is about the fate of the world and the world, what the world will look like going forward. Um, you know, I think one of the things, Moses, your comment about trying to think about a blackness that is connected to your experience and your lineage and not wanting to let go of that, I think is also really important as we, I mentioned in my last comment about how blackness is a colonial concept, but it's an interesting and double-edged concept. And the fact that we're having this conversation right now, I think speaks to that, that even though this was a tool a concept that was used to expropriate land and humans from each other um, and threw us all into this big basket and flattened our experiences and our genealogies and our cultures. It has also brought us into conversation with each other. And um, certainly in the Atlantic world, um, as blackness has been associated with enslavement and pain and denigration, I will say as the descendant of people enslaved, it also has been an amazing source of creativity and culture that has been medicine for us and has inspired people all around the world. So I don't want us to just go into blackness is only. Blackness is, is amorphous in a lot of ways and in some really impactful ways has become a tool that is even more powerful than anything colonizers could have brought to our people. And how we use it or not um, is really up to us as we try to assert our agency. And so for our final question to the panel, especially thinking about this as part of Sundance, where we have people who are engaging with creative representations of all sorts of experiences all around our planet. I'm interested in asking each of you as we close, what would you like to see? What kind of media would matter to you to see as we move this conversation forward? Just um, I mean, the reason, the reason why I took the direction that I took in my my career, and you know, started to become where as I started off as an actor, then became a, a writer and a playwright, was to um, tell the stories that weren't being told. So I um, so I want to see just more <laughs> more of things that I can I I can relate to and identify um, with, and that's that's why I do the work that I do. So just yeah. I think uh, for me, when I think about uh, media, um, my, I think the sense of urgency for me is, um, you know, we need to encourage media that emphasizes the positionality of people of color, you know, uh, that talks about these kinds of things that we are talking about. Uh, because we, you know, like all of us here, we are not talking about this issue of blackness as an intellectual exercise, you know, we experience it, we live it. These are lived experiences that we share and that I'm so, you know, uh, very passionate about. And so positionality is important, you know, media and, you know, you know just reading uh, Esther's uh, bio, wow, I want to know Esther and, you know, I want to use some of her movies, you know, films and documentary in my class. And, uh, you know, if I can stretch my luck, I would like to have her come talk to my class, even virtually. And so the, the kinds of things, we need to create a lot of Esther, you know, positionality, media, you know, Moses, you know, that's what I think is urgent, urgently needed. Yeah, I second that. Just lots of, um, not the same, but different. Lots and lots and lots and lots of stories coming out of Kanaki and the Solomon Islands and Papua and Fiji and you name it. Lots and lots and lots. Yeah, definitely, and I appreciate you folks. You know, once again, you know, for all your contributions to this talk, and you know, many thanks to everyone once again, attendees, panelists, uh, for joining in today's session. You know, thank you especially to the panelists, you know, for sharing your brilliance, your knowledge, experiences, you know, the provocative ideas, and really trying to push us to, you know, not only think through, but also reimagine what blackness could look like, not only on a different slate, or perhaps we even just need a broken slate to go off of in order to rebuild it for our own selves. Um, also, many thanks to the Home Room Museum BART, Sundance for the opportunity to have this conversation and the visual communications uh, for your technical assistance in the production of this. You know, this is such an important conversation that I really hope that we can you know, continue to have, and I encourage us all to continue to have as we explore black visuality in Oceania, how it complicates and even involves our understanding surrounding race, indigeneity, solidarity, and social justice within and beyond the Pacific. You know, please be sure to follow uh, the Popola Project, OMA Ethnic Studies, and you know the brilliant folks in this room as they continue to create works and push those you know 
boundaries, you know, around blackness much further. So thanks once again, everyone. Appreciate it. And have a great afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Or morning.